Uh, welcome to this live garden Q&A on this uh, Sunday, March the 27th. For those that don't know me, my name is Frank Fergini, aka Frankie Flowers. And you're probably wondering if you've never been on here before, why this guy? Well, this guy here is a four-time best-selling garden author. I have uh, titles such as Food to Grow, uh, Get Growing, which is a general guide to gardening, uh, Potted Up, which is one on containers, and then Power Plants, which is a great book that I wrote with a homeopath all about the benefits of plants and those that you can grow around your home that could actually help you with your health. Uh, I come here each and every Sunday morning between 9 and 9.30, most Sunday mornings that is, the occasional one I miss because of my family. Uh, but I'm here to answer your garden questions to kind of inspire you and get you going and get you growing in this world that we call gardening. Uh, and on this snowy Sunday morning here in Southern Ontario, because I'm broadcasting just north of Toronto, Ontario. My family has two garden centers, one in Bradford, one in Barrie. They're called Bradford Greenhouse's Garden Gallery. That's where I've gotten almost all my garden experience. Of course, just my own individual experience. And then I've done things like design gardens for Canada Blooms. I'm on the board of directors for Royal Botanical Gardens. I've worked very closely with uh, a lot of annual growers across the country, as well as perennial growers. Uh, and I just overall just love to talk plants. Um, we're saying hi this morning from Jessica. Sharon saying a good morning this morning too. Uh, Maria saying a good morning as well from Lyle, which is just, uh, just I would say west of Barrie. So good morning to you as well. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the world today. I, I'm going to go and start off with a really good question that I had from Roberta Fleming. And she sent me this question via email. And her question was, hey, I have a lot of rabbit poo on my property and I do too because I've had a lot of just wild rabbits, cottontails on my property. And her question was, can I use that manure in the garden? So I did a little bit of research. I'm just going to share this with you guys here. And I went to look at uh, some of the uh, articles that are out there. And then I found out this article here from Michigan State University. Bunny honey using rabbit manure as fertilizer. This is a little article about a 4-H student who uh, ended up turning it into rabbit manure into a business. And what I learned about rabbit manure is rabbit manure has four times more nutrients than cow or horse manure. It's twice as rich as chicken manure. Corn house manure are considered hot and need to be composted to be used as fertilizers. Rabbit manure is an organic and improves poor soil structure, drainage, and moisture retention. It improves the life cycle of microorganisms in the soil. Worms love rabbit manure. And it's not as smelly as other manures and it's easier to handle. So the question there in terms of the manure is indeed, you, you got it. Yeah, you can use rabbit manure in your garden. It's going to be better. So some of those little rabbit pellets that are setting out, you can either put them in your compost or put them in your containers. And it seems that the rabbit poop is some good poop that's overall. Um, good morning. From Stratford this morning, hello, Ruth, to you as well. We have another shout out, good morning as well. Happy spring from Curtis, Ontario as well. Uh, good morning this morning, as we have another shout out this morning to Heather. Uh, Heather Fellows, good morning to you as well. Uh, good morning from Snowy Gravenhurst this morning, bring on spring. I'm actually going to be broadcasting live tomorrow morning, each and every morning, if you don't know. You can see me on breakfast television. That's where I'm wild about weather, but I'm also passionate about plants. Each and every day I talk about the weather. But tomorrow I will be broadcasting live from Buckhorn Lake uh, with Princess Margaret uh, showing their cottage that they have up for sale. Well, not for sale, their cottage that they're going to be drawing in that early bird draw. So that's happening tomorrow morning on BT. Um, what do I do with my hydrangeas? This is from Shar. So I get a lot of questions about hydrangeas and I'm assuming the hydrangeas you're speaking about are the ones outdoors because right now you're starting to see potted hydrangeas at grocery stores, at garden centers, as we're approaching Easter, a potted hydrangea indoors is one that's quite popular. Potted hydrangeas indoors are pretty heavy water users. And a lot of the times you do have to really keep an eye on watering. And I always say water them in the sink. So basically when you're watering a potted hydrangea at home, Fill up your sink with water, take that hydrangea, take it out of the pot cover, that decorative pot cover. It'll be in a green grower pot then or a black grower pot. Then what you're going to do is sink it into the sink, the bottom part. And as soon as you don't see any bubbles anymore, that's fully watered, then you can put it into the pot cover. If it is an outdoor hydrangeas, there are different varieties of hydrangeas that bloom on old wood or hydrangeas that bloom on new wood. And what that means to you is those that bloom on new wood 
are those that can be pruned in fall and or spring, no problem. So those are things like PG hydrangeas, Annabella hydrangeas, limelight hydrangeas, all those different hydrangeas, generally the ones that are flowering white and or cone shaped, Annabella, Incredible, those are some other ones. If your hydrangea is a macrophilia, and generally those guys there are a large leaf hydrangea, more of a thicker, glossy kind of leaf, they are the ones that are usually the purples, the pinks, uh, sometimes seen as blue. Uh, those hydrangeas bloom on old wood and they should be just totally left alone. And what you wait till is in spring when things start to leaf out, any dead wood, you're just pruning that dead wood off. And the reason why is if you were to prune those in spring, prune them back down, any of that, the flower buds that are sitting there, you won't have any blooms whatsoever. So the key is with hydrangeas is to figure out, do they bloom on new wood or old wood, the variety, and that's going to tell you what you should be doing. And often if they are blooming on new wood, early spring, even on a day where it's cold and things are really not growing outdoors, but you can get out there, you can get pruning and kind and cleaning and cutting and things like that in your garden as well. Uh, here's another question that we have this morning. Good morning, Frankie. This is from Paula Polly. Where does one take a sample of their soil to be tested and ensure it's right for vegetable gardeners? Is testing necessary? Thanks. Uh, good question. There are some basic soil tests that you can purchase. And those soil tests that you can purchase online are just really ones that are going to tell you the pH of the soil. And generally with the vegetable gardens, they want to be neutral to slightly acidic. That's where you're going to have, especially with tomatoes. Tomatoes want a little bit more of an acidic soil. If you have a good compost, meaning that soil that when you put it in your hand and you go to kind of work it into your hand, it actually clumps together and falls apart. You generally don't need to do a soil test. If you are concerned and your vegetables just don't seem as vibrant, vibrant, then you can send soil tests off. Best thing to do is to Google and there are different soil testing facilities that they'll send you a kit to test and then you'll send it back out and you'll get a result. I will post also some good soil tests. That's a good uh, article to do. So we're just actually um, doing some articles, new articles for the website. The website's been a little bit delayed. Everything this year has been delayed. It's taking longer. Uh, for those who are wondering about the garden course that I'm setting to, to launch, that I was hoping to launch this spring, I'm postponing that because I'm going to do it better. I want to make sure that it's done right, not that it's done quickly. So I'm working on that as well. So things are just getting busy. Uh, general message from Toronto. Uh, this is from Jean E. Eggplant and pepper seedlings are sprouting inside. We'll be planting tomato seeds today. That's a great thing. Uh, this is the time that you should be doing your tomatoes, your peppers, your eggplants. You could even consider doing some cauliflower and broccoli if you're starting seeds indoors. A reminder that they really don't need any light as they to, until they germinate. Once they get to a three to five leaf stage, that's where you need some bright light. Sometimes it's a good idea to actually incorporate some grow lights, uh, those grow lights being closer to the seedlings and then you're raising them. If you're finding your seedlings are stretching, generally they're stretching for the light or they're just too warm or you're doing too much water. So we really want to prevent stretching because once you start to stretch a seedling, that's when it can kind of get out of control. Uh, Christine is saying good morning uh, from, Christine that is, good morning from Prince Edward County. Good morning from you, one of my favorite places in the province as well, a great place to be. Uh, Andrew Sweeney, good morning to you as well. Uh, good morning from Blessery Rosso this morning. Yeah, it really does feel like winter that's out there. Hey, I'm going to give you guys a hope of spring right now too. I'm going to show you something else that's going on in the world too. Let's tell you what's going on right now. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not there, but my good friend Tanya is there and that's the California Spring Trials 2022. So if you're wondering what the California Spring Trials are, these are grower trials where growers go to look at some new varieties of plants from breeders. And if you're just wondering some of the different breeders out there that are bringing you new varieties of plants, this is just a list of some of the international breeders that are out there creating new innovation in plant material. Everybody from Danzinger to Cohen, you can see Benari that's there, as well as you will have some Cicada Seeds as well, which is a big company as well. Uh, Sunset, you can see Centauri, Westhoff. These are all people that you probably don't know of, Selecta as well. So if you go and you click on Selecta 1, you can see that they're uh, doing their seed trials right now and their plant trials as well. So if you want to find out in a couple of weeks time, we're going to find out what is the what was the best things that they saw at the trials and really what was it that uh, everybody loved there? So let me just see if I can okay, cancel. There we go. We're back. Okay. So I do know it's kind of blustery out there, but there's a lot going on in the world of spring right now. So lots to look forward to. There's another good morning from Toronto this morning. Uh, we got good morning from Kingston, one from Scarborough, one from Aurelia. 
Uh, good morning from Helena is saying good morning. Scarborough, I'm just looking for a question here. Here we go. I think we got a question from Sherry. Uh, good morning, LOL. Just wondering when to trim our honeysuckle tree. Best time to be pruning anything. And this is a general rule of gardening and one that you're never going to fail. So if you're an old-time gardener, a new gardener, or somebody that's just interested in gardening, bloom, uh, prune after bloom. So pruning after flowering is the best time. Honeysuckle trees, uh, so what we're doing is in spring, if we're uncertain when to prune, is we wait till things leaf out and we always remove any broken limbs, any broken stems, and any dead stems and or branches. You're always, no matter what time of year, uh, during the growing season or in spring, once things leaf out, we prune those out. Then we prune after they bloom. Your honeysuckle actually is fairly vibrant and uh, because it is an easy plant, you can actually prune that guy pretty much at any time of the year. However, if we were to prune a lilac in early spring, that lilac blooms with flower buds that were developed last season. So we'll be removing those flowers. That's the reason why we prune after bloom and you never fail overall. <clears throat> uh, we got another shout out this morning, uh, replying from Karen. Hello, neighbor. Oh, I love it that people are talking on here too. Uh, this is another good morning as well from Cheryl from Scarborough this morning. Here's another good question as well. Is cow manure and triple mix a good combination <clears throat> for your lawn? Yes, indeed. So um, a lot of the times we are thinking about improving our lawn. And the way to actually have a lawn that is with less weeds is that we make the lawn the strongest plant that's there. How do we make the lawn the strongest plants that's there? And a lot of that comes down to fertilizing, top dressing, overseeding, and mowing the lawn as well. It's because we're really thickening the lawn up. And in spring, as soon as soil temperatures start to warm above 15 degrees, that is the soil temperature needs to be above 15 degrees, that's when we can consider to start seeding our lawn. There's really no use to be putting down soil too early because if we put down soil too early, weed seeds can sit there and those weed seeds can germinate. So we want to put soil and then seed. Uh, triple mix already does have manure in it. That's the reason why it's a three-in-one mix. <clears throat> a lot of the times it has manure. So I don't really know if you need to add the cow manure to that. I'd probably stay away from just straight triple mix. Uh, cow manure, if it's composted, is a good thing. It needs to be when you hear about a hot manure, a hot manure means when it comes right out of the cow, it's highly acidic, as well as some of the cow manures. Also, if they're getting it from a friend, a, a farmer, if you're going to be kind of getting that cow manure, try to go more to the center of the pile, not to the outside of the pile. And the reason for that is sometimes those manures themselves uh, can have a lot of weed seeds if they're not uh, a bag manure and or sterilized manure that's there. Um, here's the question that we have here. I have a limelight. Uh, limelight, that char blooms on... New wood, so those guys there you can prune in spring, you can prune it in fall, and I have a light pink one. <clears throat> the light pink one depends on the variety. If it's a macrophilia, you may be able to see on the tag, uh, and or sometimes the light pinks can also be one that blooms on new wood, but definitely the limelights bloom on new wood. Here we go. Uh, this is a question. This is from Judy. Planted a pineapple top 24 months ago. That's kind of fun to do. Those pineapples, you cut the top off. And with those, you can kind of germinate them. You could do that as well. Even the bottom of a romaine, after you've done the romaine, you can stick that in the soil. It'll reflush out. It now has a pineapple bloom. How to treat it? And uh, now, uh, will the plant die or bloom again? So the bloom itself is just something for you to enjoy. After the bloom period's done, you can cut that bloom off, and it should still flush out and grow. It should have developed its root system, if it, of course, if it's in a bloom period. Judy, I'd love to see a picture of this, so if you could. And I'd love to show a picture of this next week right here on this Facebook Live. So Judy, if you could please send me an email, Frankie, that's with an IE, at frankieflowers.com. Frankie, IE, at frankieflowers.com. That is something so fun to do with kids. Uh, as I mentioned, you can do that with romaine. You could do that with a pineapple top. You can germinate some avocados as well. These are all things that kids are eating in their home and where we can actually create lessons and also have some fun. Uh, here's another question that we have this morning from N. Crawl, I guess it is. Morning, Frank. Can I trim shrubs now? I have one prickly barberry that needs attention. So the barberry, yes, while it's in dormant, dormancy, you can go ahead and prune that at this time of the year. Barberry is a, a thorny plant, so just be watch out for that guy because indeed it's prickly, as you mentioned there. Barberry for years was one plant that wasn't available for sale in Ontario because it was related to some diseases, but now that has gone. Um, so that barberry can, barberries are easily pruned at any time of the year. So I have no worries about that. Depends on the shrub, of course. Uh, but those guys there, I feel confident for you to do a uh, good morning from Stratford this morning. How do I start a raised bed in a galvanized trough like you have? So the galvanized troughs that I use are stock troughs. 
uh, you're in Stratford. So Stratford had a TSC, which I think is now PV Mart. That's where I, I get my stock troughs from farm supply centers or even some from some farmers. Uh, the key about those galvanized tubs are they do have a drainage plug on the bottom that you can pull that out. But I would also drill additional holes in the bottom of the tubs because we need to make sure that it does have good drainage. Those tubs themselves actually take a ton of soil capacity. So generally in the bottom of the tubs, I've actually taken uh, wood, uh, which is just chopped wood. And I put those up and I've stacked them actually uh, as they're, instead of them being flat like this, I've actually stacked them upright down through the center of that tub. It actually improves the drainage further and it actually takes a little bit of soil mass. And as those break down, will add to the soil itself. And that's about it. Place them in full sun, really key. Use a good soil in them. I used a, a good quality triple mix that I bought in bulk because it almost takes a cubic yard depending upon the size. My guys here are six feet long. They're the bigger size ones and they almost took a cubic yard of soil each because they're big. Benefit of those raised beds is you got great soil, large soil capacity so they don't dry out. They're elevated so they stay away from uh, rabbits. But in the winter when the snow load got up, the rabbits hopped in there and ate the rest of the kale. But those are just a little bit about doing the troughs. I love the troughs. They're galvanized so they don't rot and or rust and they last for years. So there you go. Uh, here we go. Another question that we have here. Fertilizer with corn, gluten, cornmeal. Grub be gone. Grassy. When does each get applied? So this is a good question for you, Lisa. I'm just going to take a little sip of coffee here as well. Mm. So corn gluten. Right now with Ontario Cosmetic Pesticide Bans and many pesticide bans that we have across the country, we have limited resources. But one thing that we can do to prevent the germination of seeds, specifically weed seeds like uh, crabgrass, is we can apply corn gluten. Corn gluten, as soon as the snow load melts and we're starting to see ground frost leave the soil, and as soon as we start to see a few leaves, that's when we're going to leaves start to crack buds on plants. That's when we're going to start to apply corn gluten down. We want to put corn gluten down when the weed seeds and the seeds that are sitting there are dormant. That will prevent the germination of weed seeds for six months and prevent the germination of those weed seeds that are sitting there. For, for not six months, six weeks, forgive me. Six weeks, correction, six weeks. So after six weeks, that's when we'll put down some soil and then we'll apply some seed, some new fresh lawn seed that's down. So that's going to reduce the germination of crabgrass. It's also going to reduce any dandelion seeds that are sitting there. But dandelions themselves, if they were there from last year, the dandelion plant, it's a perennial taproot. Then you have to remove those dandelions from your lawn and remove the taproot. Um, Grub Be Gone is a BTK. That there is applied when the soil temperatures are a little bit warmer. And I would feel most comfortable you doing that mid-May to the end of May. So generally, uh, depending upon where you are across the country watching me now, best way to indicate uh, the corn gluten we're putting on early spring. The seed and top dressing, redoing that is mid-spring to late spring. And the grub be gone as well, mid-spring to late spring. So there you go. Okay. Um, here we go as well. Maybe I already did this one. Hi, Frankie. When do you use to sharpen your garden tools, pruning shoes and law period? What do you use? Forgive me. What do I use is I actually have a good friend, which is uh, Nella, uh, Nella Restaurant Supply, but they're knife sharpeners. So ideally, if you can find knife sharpeners in there still, if you look on Google, you'll find some knife sharpeners and you'll even find some, depending upon where you live, if you live in urban areas, uh, you can get uh, some of them will even come to your home. If you're looking for sharpening tools, Felco does have some sharpening tools that are available that you can use to sharpen them yourselves, and you're just going to be filing them down. Key is to clean them. Cleaning, sharpening your garden tools, even now is a good indication, uh, but just look for a good knife sharpener. My, I'm lucky, if you're asking me specifically, my really good friend is Ralph Nella, uh, so I have uh, my knife sharpener guy. Boom. Good shout out to Nella as well. Hi, Frankie. Uh, that's the same question that we have here as well. So here's another question, I think. Uh, what's your views on using rubber mulch? This is from Elizabeth. So the rubber mulch itself is a great thing to use if you're putting it underneath, let's say, um, a playground. Okay. Uh, the black rubber mulch itself is something that attracts sunlight and can get quite hot, but in terms of impact, so that rubber mulch itself is, um, in terms of impact, meaning that a child falling, it'll actually cushion that fall as well in the garden. 
the rubber mulch itself, it will retain moisture, it will reduce weeding, but it won't add back into the soil. So the benefits of mulching a garden, you know, really we're trying to mulch a garden to reduce weeding, to reduce the use of water and to be more uh, conservative on our water use. But then also as the mulch breaks down, it's improving our soil overall. So it's kind of like a full circle. Rubber mulch doesn't do that. So in garden settings, I tend not to like to use rubber mulch, but for decorative purposes or in areas where uh, I don't have any plant material growing or in an area like a playground setting, rubber mulch is exceptionally good and a great use. It's gotten quite expensive uh, as well because rubber mulch now is a premium because there's so many good, great products that are being made of recycled tires. Rubber mulch is just one of them, but there's pots and mats and so many other things that are out there as well. Um, good morning. We have a good morning here from Sue. Is mushroom compost best for planters? Mushroom compost is absolutely fantastic, but just you can't use just straight mushroom compost. Uh, mushroom compost has a lot of peat within it, so it actually dries out quite quickly. Mixing mushroom compost in with a good triple mix is some way to elevate, but for planters themselves, planters itself is... Uh, one that you're going to need more of a lighter soil. So I would probably use, uh, I would use two thirds uh, of mushroom compost and one third soil to create a really good kind of container mix that you could use in your planters. And that'd be a good natural mix that's there. That would do very, very well that's out there. Matthew Amos, my good friend, saying good morning to you as well this morning. Uh, here we go with another question that we have. Good morning from Scarborough. This is from Pam. We decided to go with uh, white clover this year for our backyard. Thank you for the tip. I have a backyard that is small and facing north with a red maple tree. We have lived there for 13 years this month with zero grass. So the white clover is something that is a fairly durable. And what I may even suggest with your Pam is just to mix in a little bit of shade grass seed within that white clover. The white clover, once it gets going, it'll fill that area. White clover is something soft to walk on. You can cut with a lawnmower. It looks good and will grow in poorer soils, shaded areas. And once it actually starts to start to fill in, will actually uh, grow where there's a little less moisture because that maple tree is not only shading, but that maple tree itself is taking out some moisture. So you will need to still, it's not just throw some seed down and forget about it. You will need to put some water down there and just put a little bit of top dressing of soil overall and mix in some grass seed up there as well. So here we go with another question, I think. Uh, I also have a climbing rose. <laughs> this is the, uh, another one. The great showing last year is the training that I'm training over a pergola or pergola. When should I prune it? Uh, the stalks I don't want uh, growing in a particular direction. Thanks. So basically what I would do is wait till they start to crack and or leaf out. At that time, you can prune those stems that are growing in the direction that you don't want. And then at the same time, you can remove any dead wood. You will have a lot of top growth dead wood on that plant itself because of the cold winter that we had with the last snow load. And with that, you're gonna have some dead wood and that dead wood will, in, even in early spring, will appear black. So if you're seeing any black stems that are out there, that's usually a good indication of dead wood on a rose. Here's another question that we have here. This is from Helena. Frank, can I prune my locust tree and when? And can I transplant a baby locust tree that planted in the wrong place last year in September? Thank you very much. So the transplanting of that baby locust can be done in early spring, as soon as ground frost is done, I would recommend that you use a quick start fertilizer. Their Grow has, where is it? I think this is the one you're going to Whoa, sorry about that, guys. So here we go right here. Uh, this is the quick start fertilizer. So the reason why I would recommend that quick start fertilizer is it's just going to reduce the amount of transplant shock that that baby locust is going to go into. Locusts are pretty easy trees. Uh, best time to really be pruning any of those shade trees is when they're in dormancy. Uh, now that we are in spring, they're just coming out of dormancy. So on a shade tree, if any broken stems, stems, limbs, or branches, I'd feel comfortable pruning those uh, now because they're broken and or dead. But for doing a bunch of pruning, I'd rather you prune them after the leaves have flushed out or better yet, in winter. So winter is the best time to be pruning shade trees because they are in dormancy and it's easier to prune at that time. So there we go, Helena. Hope that helped you out there as well. Uh, here's another question that's there. Good morning. Is it too late to prune my peach and cherry trees in the spring? It is. Any smaller branches, if you have any small branches growing inward to the center, you can do some selective pruning there. Any large branches, please don't touch that. 
uh, because now that even though we're cold today, we've already seen temperatures of 17 degrees. We already have sap out there flowing on maple trees. So if we were to prune a fruit tree at this time and we get a warm up, that tree is going to bleed. So I would uh, stay away from pruning any dead stems, as I mentioned, anytime you can prune those overall. Here we go with another question. My rosemary, parsley, and basil survived the winter. Congratulations on that. That's great. When can I put rosemary and parsley outside? What minimum temperature? So this is for Marlene. And Marlene, it's usually the overnight temperature that we're watching. The overnight temperature is when we need frost-free conditions. If you're watching me this morning from Southern Ontario, frost-free conditions generally don't happen until after the middle of May. Sometimes it can be as late as the end of May, so we still have to watch the temperature. But as long as the overnight temperature does not dip below, I would say, five degrees, basil, rosemary can go out if it's a little bit of a cool night, if it's around five degrees. Basil, really, it's when the overnight temperature, you don't want it below 10 degrees. Basil, even if you were to put it outdoors or basil in a cold, windy location, it'll that basil or basil hates a cold wind. Rosemary is a much tougher plant. Parsley, a much tougher plant as well. But the last one that you want to put out is basil as well. And just a reminder, sometimes you want to put them outdoors first in a partially shaded area and then move them into more of a sunny area because they need to adjust to those sunlight levels. It's been in your home. <clears throat> and sometimes by putting it right immediately outdoors in that full sun, it'll scorch them and or uh, burn them overall. Uh, we got a good morning from Wasaga Beach this morning as well. Uh, good morning to you. We got another good morning out there as well from Rosie. Good morning to you. Uh, big shout out to Faith in Toronto this morning. Good morning to you. Uh, here's another question that we have this morning too from Trish. Morning, yellow leaves. Would that be the same for every plant? If so, what's the issue? Thank you. So a yellowing leaf of an indoor plant is an indication of stress. So I have my anthurium here, which does very, very well in this location. But sometimes a yellowing leaf can be due to underwater. It can be due to overwater. That indication of stress can be that it's just close to a heating vent. It could be due to a lack of light. If it has a burned tip, it can be too much light. So we really have to work our way back and to say, number one, let's put our finger in the soil. If that soil is sitting there sopping wet, if it's in a decorative pot, we may want to take it out of that grower pot and then empty the water in the bottom of that decorative pot. If it's planted in a pot that has no drainage, then we may have to repot it. That yellowing leaf is it might be just drowning in that. If it's too dry, we need, may need to water. Those yellowing leaves, after we figure out the problem, we generally want to cut those yellow, yellow leaves off. They're not going to go back to green. We cut them off and it'll replace with a new leaf that's out there. Uh, then also sometimes yellowing, it's very rare that a yellowing leaf is caused by an insect. But if you see any holes, any sticky substance on the leaf itself, uh, any bubbles on the leaf, that's a sign of insects. So yellow leaf is stress. So we got to figure out what's stressing the plant. If you wish, Trish, you can send me a picture, frankie at frankieflowers.com, and I'll take a look at it and see if I can help you. I'm going to go to one more question because uh, a couple more questions I think we have here. Uh, room four. Sandy, what do I do with aphid outbreak on health plants that, that will soon go outside? So you want to use Bug Be Gone. Bug Be Gone is an insecticidal soap that you can use safely indoors. Uh, it's something that will overcoat those uh, aphids and smother them and kill them. Once those plants will go outside, even if you had some few aphids outdoors, uh, once it gets warmer, ladybugs will come and help you as well. But you may do, need to do a couple applications of Bug Be Gone. Just a reminder, those plants that have the aphids indoors, kind of keep them quarantined, like put them, you know that word, put them away from other plants so they don't affect other plants. If they're badly infected and the health of the plant is terrible, Sometimes you even consider just to discard that plant and then spray the others so that you don't have any issues. But give them a spraying of Bug Be Gone. That'll help you out, that insecticidal soap. Here we go to Char again. I got burning bush last summer. I'm assuming a rabbit ate all the leaves. Will it come back? It, that's a Ioana miscellata, uh, which is burning bush. Uh, yes, rabbits, mice do like that. Next year, what you would like to do is to spray it with something called Animal Be Gone and or scoot, those two products will leave a residual taste on them and they won't eat them. Will it come back? We'll have to wait and see. But if it's over 50% chewed, pretty unlikely. It's probably so stressed that it may die. So just to give you a heads up on that. Uh, big shout out this morning too. Good morning from Johnny's Garden Show in Tilsonburg. Johnny's Garden Show in Tilsonburg. Good morning, Linda. Good morning to you. Um, and I don't know what garden, Johnny's Garden Show is, but we'll give it a shout out. 
I always shout out any way that people are out there inspiring, even if you have some garden events, if you have some garden events that you want me to promote here, plant sales, things like that, Frankie at frankieflowers.com. I'll give you a shout out. We'll do that. We'll even show your website. Um, there's a lot of events that are coming up that I'm speaking at. The Cottage Life Show coming up on April the 9th. I'll be there live that Saturday. I'll tell you that I do have some giveaways that I'll be doing live on that show that day at the Cottage Life Show. So now the shows are coming back. So I'm kind of excited about that as well. Uh, what is the best way to grow a money tree? We're going to end off with this question here. And this is from Boric. Uh, Boric, it needs to be in a room that's going to have bright natural light. Uh, that room could be one that's west or south facing. Even if you have big windows on an east facing, uh, it'll be good. Key is, is to allow it to dry out in between waterings. If you are repotting, make sure that pot has a, a drainage. Uh, fertilizing, you're only going to be fertilizing it once a month. You can use an all-purpose miracle Grow fertilizer. Quite easy. Always monitor. They're really actually, money trees quite easy to grow. Uh, a lot of the times people kill with kindness, too much water. Just keep an eye out for any sticky substance on the leaves. Those there can be anything from uh, spider mites to aphids uh, that can be causing that sticky substance that's there. So those are just a few tips. But overall, bright natural light, water, wind, dry, fertilize once a month. And that's about it. It's a pretty easy plant. Uh, so there you guys go. You will see me tomorrow morning live on Breakfast Television where I'll be live from the Princess Margaret Cottage, that early bird uh, prize. Uh, it's going to be kind, kind of cool out there on Buckhorn Lake. So I got some driving ahead of me for today. It's always so great to share a little bit of garden advice here and to get you inspired for the spring that's up and coming. Uh, check out my website, frankieflowers.com. Uh, an updated website will be coming shortly. Uh, you can always reach out to me on all my social media platforms as well. Thanks for watching on this Sunday morning. And a reminder, gardening is always better than therapy. And the reason being, it makes us feel good. We grow great things. And at the end, we get tomatoes. There's nothing like good tomatoes. I can't wait to tomato season. Yeah. <laughs>